Well, good morning, and welcome to our worship service. It's going to be a, a warm one today, so uh, we have to fight the, the lethargy bug, and hopefully you won't nod off too much when I'm preaching. You know, us long-winded preachers, and, and when it gets hot in the summers, they don't work too well. So, excited to be here, though, and, and to be worshiping with you. Uh, a few announcements I'd like to go over with you. There's uh, a few changes in a bulletin. The deacon trustee meeting was scheduled on Tuesday, and that has been changed to Wednesday evening at 6. So if you are a deacon or trustee, don't forget that we won't be meeting on Tuesday, but we will be meeting on Wednesday at 6. And um, because we like to have meetings on Wednesdays this week, we're going to have another meeting on Wednesday for the Christian Education Committee to talk about the Sunday School program coming up this fall. And that's going to be meeting at 3 p.m. So we're going to have a couple meetings scheduled on Wednesday. Uh, so don't forget if you are on the Christian Education Committee or would just even maybe like to give some input and your thoughts on things. We'd love to have you there as well. Uh, you're welcome to come. Uh, but for sure, those on the Christian Ed Committee be here on Wednesday at 3. And uh, deacons, trustees will be meeting on Wednesday at 6. Uh, also, the WMF. Uh, that if you're not familiar with the WMF, it's basically just the women of the church meeting together, uh, and it's a really good organization, and it's not just here in Bethany, but across the, the nation. We have churches all over the country that are part of what's called the WMF, and uh, you are invited to come out to the church on Thursday at 11 a.m., and you'll be having your meeting. Also, um, we've been getting the Lutheran ambassador. Some of you may be grabbed one of these when you came in. If you didn't grab one when you came in, please grab one when you leave. I hate to just have a big pile of these and throw them in the trash. Um, we've been getting these and we've not been having a whole lot of people take them. It's a monthly publication that our headquarters puts out. They're written by lay people. They're written by pastors. There's articles by missionaries. It's really good, good reading. These are free to you for you to take. Please, I'd much rather you take them even if you only read one article, and then you can throw away if you want. Um, I have reduced how many we're going to be getting next month, um, and I don't want to keep reducing them. I'd like to actually go the other way. So please grab um, one of these on your way out if you haven't grabbed one already. Um, we also have um, our worship service and picnic coming up, and that's our annual outdoor worship service and picnic on Sunday, August 28th at 11 a.m. at Cullaby Lake County Park. And that's located um, right off of U.S. Highway 101 between Astoria and Seaside. Hamburgers, hot dogs, and drinks will be provided. Um, you're encouraged to bring a dish to share, salad, chips, veggies, desserts. The possibilities are endless. I love that. <laughs> so looking forward to having, um, having an outdoor service with you guys then. Also, today is the uh, first Sunday of the month, and that's typically when we have communion. And, um, you know, I recognize that communion is, is a little different for different people, especially depending upon your church background. Some churches practice what they call closed communion, that if you're not a member, you can't take communion. Some people view communion as, oh, it's just a good thing. It's not a real big deal. Do it if you want to do it. Don't do it if you don't want to do it. Um, and that's kind of on the other extreme. Uh, we're kind of located somewhere in the middle. We understand, as Christ says, that this is his body and this is his blood, because that's what he said, and that when we take it, we take it for the forgiveness of our sins, because again, that's what God says in his word. Uh, we don't really understand how it works. We don't understand how it's his body and it's his blood. Uh, Luther came up with this phrase, in with and under the elements is Christ's body and blood. That's a fancy way of saying we don't really know how it works, but Christ is present in the sacrament. We say it's a sacrament because God gives us the forgiveness of our sins. And some say, well, well how is that possible? So it's only through Jesus. And that is correct. It is through Jesus. Jesus held up the bread. He said, this is my body. He held up the wine and said, this is my blood. And then he invited us to take this into ourselves. And then he says, for the forgiveness of our sins. If you are a baptized believer, that means that you're a Christian, that you've been baptized, you've been sealed in your faith, and you're sorry for your sins, you are a worthy participant of the Lord's Supper, regardless of your background, regardless of maybe something that you've been struggling with. Um, you know, a communion is for sinners. It's for people that recognize that they need Jesus in their lives, 
And the wonderful thing about the sacrament of communion is, is that as you taste it, you are literally tasting the forgiveness of your sins. And that's a reminder that I think we all need to have. So just to, as a clarification, and also um, in the past we've been doing communion where you come up the center and you go out the sides. We're going to go back to the old school and uh, we're going to have communion around the railing here. And if you're not able to come forward and kneel, you can remain in, in a pew in a seat and one of the ushers will alert us and we'll come back and give you a communion. Or if you don't feel comfortable with a big group of people up here, you can remain in your seats as well. We are perfectly fine coming out and giving you communion. Uh, Eric and I will both be wearing masks. We'll be using hand sanitizer as well, so we're very careful with that. Uh, but we, we want to invite you to participate fully in this special sacrament. Uh, before we move into our service, are there any other announcements that I left off that we need to highlight? All right, well, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which is truth. And Lord, this, this Sunday in Sunday school, we, we, we dealt with that a lot. And uh, we've been learning about other groups that, that don't hold to your word as truth. And uh, Father, what we need to do is to understand you better. We need to understand your word. We need to live out that word. And uh, Father, we just pray that you'd open our hearts and our minds today, that we would listen and that we would apply these lessons to our lives and that, Lord, that people would know we are Christians, not because of our church affiliation, not because of anything that we say, but most importantly, from how we live our lives and what we do. So that you would be glorified today, Father. We, we come before you to worship you because you are truly worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if the congregation is able to rise, would you please rise as we sing our opening hymn, hymn number 207, Praise the Lord, ye heavens, adore him. Please remain standing as you are able as we confess our sins before the Lord. The, the confession of sin is found printed in your bulletin or on the screen before you. And let us confess. Almighty and everlasting God, we bow before you in repentance for our sins. We have sinned against you in many ways, most of which are unknown even to us. Forgive us for bad attitudes that offend you for remarks that hurt you and others, for not following your word and spirit as they try to lead us. Forgive us for those times when we have forgotten to call upon you and help us to live our lives in the way that will please you. This we pray, thanking you for your great love for us. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And if this be your sincere confession... And if with penitent hearts you earnestly desire the forgiveness of your sins, for the sake of Jesus Christ, God, according to his promise, forgives you all of your sins. And by the authority of God's word, and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I declare to you that God, through his grace, has forgiven all of your sins. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. 
As we go into our time of uh, prayer and praise, uh, we have a, a few things we need to be praying for. Uh, we've been asked to pray for a family of that seven-year-old and the father who were run over in Hammond. Also the family of Kent Cruzen, former middle school teacher who died Thursday, who was 84. The family of Nate B., who died this week, is 58 years old. Uh, there was a praise that Lois's dad's surgery went well, so we're excited about that. Um, there was a former co-worker of Kelly who passed away last week. want to pray for that family. Uh, Nancy has her eye surgery coming up, so we want to be um, praying for her for that and kind of hoping she has a cool eye patch or like all be dazzled with like beads or something. Or, that would be kind of cool. Um, so I, I won't be praying for that. We'll be praying for your eye surgery, Nancy. Uh, also for... Um, uh, for is it Barrett and Jesse and Jody off to Norway and Denmark, traveling mercy, uh, and that they uh, stay well and healthy. Uh, for Bill Mackey, for the cancer he's going through. Um, and that we're thankful that Char Sunday is home, and that the Peterson family is they grieve the unexpected death of their son Kyle. Uh, are there other prayer concerns or just praises that we'd like to offer up? Yeah. Praying for Dave's legs. When you have that constant dull aching pain, it's not fun. You can't. They won't work. Oh. All right. So Dave's legs are just not working. So we want to pray for that. No dancing. You can't give Bev a swift kick either anymore. So, <laughs> Eric. Okay, so Eric's neighbor in Chinook, uh, Bonnie Parker, has cancer and she has surgery coming up. All right, be praying for Bonnie. All right, other prayer requests? Yes. All right, Lila's doing better, and, uh, but she's still in a hospital and want to get her out of that hospital. Okay. Yes. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, awesome. Heather is a missionary we've been praying for, and her and her team are back home, and, and they're safe. Oh, I was returned. All right. Did you have something, Beth? Okay. Anything else? All right, well, let's spend a few minutes as a congregation and to lift up these, these prayer concerns. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the heat. We thank you for the sun. Uh, Lord, I know in the middle of winter, we're probably going to be grumbling and complaining about the rain and the cold. Um, and sometimes we complain when it's hot and it's sunny. Lord, we're good at complaining. Um, but Lord, we just do want to thank you for the change of the seasons, for the gorgeous sky for the warm weather that reminds us of that sun that's providing energy and heat and warmth for our planet that we need so we can live. Lord, it's just a, an awesome reminder of your goodness for us. Lord, there's a lot of things that have been brought up that, that uh, we need to, to pray for, but also some amazing praises. Lord, we're so grateful that Lois's dad's surgery went well. And uh, Lord, we just thank you for that. We also thank you for the return of Heather and her team. Uh, Lord, what, what a blessing that that is. Also, we're thankful that that Shar Sunday is home. And uh, Lord, just uh, some amazing answers to prayer. Um, Lord, we, we also want to be praying for, for people that have been struggling for a while. We think of Anastasia, for Stephanie, uh, for Cliff, for Dave, for Katherine. For, for Jack, Lord, as Jack is nearing the end of his life, especially right now, we pray for, for Georgia as well, Lord, as they go through this process of grieving. Lord, pray for Eileen and, and her vision problems and, and Lord, just learning the, the new normal. Lord, we, we, uh, we also pray for those that are wrestling with cancer, 
especially those that we've been praying for for a while, Lord. We think of uh, for Rachel, uh, for Lois, for Emily, for Bob, for Roger, and for Nathaniel, and for Kayla. Lord, we also think of, of Bill um, as well, Lord, who's, who's been struggling with cancer. And, and Lord, we think of Eric's neighbor, uh, Bonnie, and uh, Lord, as she's going to be um, having surgery coming up for, for her cancer, Lord, it's such a horrible disease, and we just ask, Lord, that you would help her and strengthen her as she goes through this, Lord. Uh, Father, we also want to continue to, to lift up Dave with his legs, and um, Lord, just not even having the ability to use them almost is, is so hard, and Lord, may you just bless Dave with strength, help the doctors to diagnose it properly and to be able to treat it and help him. Father, we're, we're thankful that Lila's almost out of the hospital. Um, Lord, we just ask that she would uh, just really continue to regain her strength and her health and that she would stay healthy, Father. Lord, we pray for, um, for the family of that seven-year-old and a father who were run over in Hammond. Uh, Lord, as they, they go through such a horrible uh, grieving time right now, Lord, comfort them and be with them. Help them to, to see, Lord, that even in the midst of their pain, Lord, that you are in control and that you love them. Father, we pray for the family of Kent Cruzen, the former middle school teacher who died on Thursday. <clears throat> Lord, help them as they grieve. We also pray for the family of Nate, uh, who passed away uh, this week as well. Father, we continue also um, pray for those families that are struggling with the loss. We think of uh, Kelly's former co-worker who's passed away. Lord, we'd ask for, for healing for their family. Lord, we, we pray for Nancy. Lord, I know that this is got to be a scary thing to have an eye surgery. And uh, Lord, she wants that pressure in her eye to be alleviated. Father, we just pray that the, the eye surgery would go exceedingly well. And Lord, that um, she would just have a complete peace going into it. Lord, that there would be like a switch that would just switch off. Lord, that all that anxiety and, and any fear would be gone after this day, Father. And uh, Lord, help Dick to support her through that. Lord, we pray for, for Barrett and Jesse and Jody as they travel off to Norway. And, and um, Lord, just help them to enjoy that trip and that they would stay healthy and safe. Uh, Lord, we also want to pray for the, the Patterson family as they grieve over the unexpected death of their son, Kyle. Uh, Lord, that's so difficult to, to go through. Lord, comfort them and be with them. Lord, for any that are at home right now um, listening and, and taking part in our service, Lord, that have heavy hearts and, and prayer concerns, Lord, may you answer their prayers as well, and any other prayer concerns that have not been mentioned. Father, we just ask that you would hear our prayers and answer them, and we pray all of this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We'll now continue our worship as we take our tithes and offerings. Please rise.
Lord, we'd ask that you bless these gifts and the givers of these gifts for your kingdom work here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Congregation may be seated. And we will continue our worship with the reading of God's word. Uh, this morning, we're going to be from the Old Testament. We'll be reading from Psalm 78, 19 through 32. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness? He struck the rocks, rocks so the water gushed out and streams overflowed. Can he also give bread or provide meat for his people? Therefore, when the Lord heard, he was full of wrath. A fire was kindled against Jacob. His anger rose against Israel. Because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his saving power. Yet he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. And he rained down on them manna to eat and gave them grain of heaven. Man ate of the bread of the angels. He sent them food in abundance. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens and by his power he let out the south wind. He rained meat on them like dust winged birds like sand on, of the seas. He let them fall in the midst of their camp all around their dwellings. And they ate and were filled and were well filled, for he gave them what they craved. But before they had satisfied their craving, while the food was still in their mouths, the anger of God rose against them, and he killed the strongest of them and laid low the young men of Israel. In spite of all this, they still sinned. Despite his wonders, they did not believe. And then James 1, 6 through 8. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And John 14, 1 through 11. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I, have, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may, also, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the the Father, and the Father is in me. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works of, thy, of themselves. It is in our, our words. We'll continue our worship as we sing together our next hymn, hymn number 589. Please feel free to remain seated.
rest of the children now come up for our children's sermon. Come on up. Any children want to come up? All right. Not yet. Okay. Petey, you're awesome. I love the fact that you come up here. And again, you get two pieces since you're the only one up here. Okay. So I don't know if you knew this about me, but I love tools. And I've had to sell so many of my tools before I came here. And I was really sad, right? But I found another tool that, and you don't think of a ladder as a tool, but it really is a tool. I found this really cool ladder. I love tools. So I thought I'd bring it out and show, show off to the church. This is, this is your tool, actually, the church's tool. This is a giant ladder. Do you know anything about ladders, Petey? Well, this is a Warner ladder. I used to sell this. This is a 300-pound duty rating fiberglass ladder that's good for electrical work because it doesn't conduct electricity. So if you hit a live wire, you won't be grounded. So this is much better than an aluminum ladder. It's a little heavier than some, some ladders, but it works really good. So even a fat guy like me can climb up this ladder. But I'm kind of afraid of heights. Are you afraid of heights at all? A little bit. Perfect. We're going to need some assistance, and we're, we're going to ask your dad to come on up. All right, so, Petey, I want you to climb as high up on a ladder as you feel comfortable with. I want to move your candy so we don't step on it. As, however high you want to go where you feel comfortable. If you want to hold the ladder because it's your daughter, that's up to you. You know, that's, that's fine. You feel comfortable up there? That's really high. You going to go one more, or is that it? Oh, <laughs> oh, that's high. Okay, now, do you, do you trust your dad? Why don't you, why don't you come down another rung? <laughs> trust your dad a little less, come down a little bit more. All right, all right. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. If you were to jump from that ladder, I'm going to come over here so your dad can be positioned to hold you. If, if you were to jump from that ladder, do you think your dad will catch you? Your mom's going to be really upset with him if he doesn't, right? You think he'll catch you? Hopefully. If you don't feel comfortable, you don't have to do it that high. You can come lower. But what I want you to do when you feel ready is to jump in your dad's arms. Don't put your knees up. <laughs> so you can come down lower if you want. No, or you, but I wouldn't go higher, just kind of jump. Okay, all right, a little lower is better. That's better, yeah. Now just lean out and fall in your dad's arms. Hey, congratulations. All right, thanks, Mickey. You can have a seat. We're done with you, but you can have candy since you helped, right? What kind of candy does your dad like? Does he like York peppermint patties or almond joys? Here, we'll throw him a York peppermint patty. All right, so Petey, I'm going to tell you a really sad story. There was a man who fathered, much like your dad, but very different in some other ways. And he had his son climb up a ladder. And he stood out about like this. What's that? No, it doesn't. So he climbed up the ladder and he stood like this. And he said, son, jump out and I'll catch you. So the, the son was scared, like you were a little scared, right? Because when you're high up there, that was really high, right? So he, kind of shaky, he jumped, waiting for his dad to catch him, and his dad did this, S stepped away, and his son smacked and hit the floor. Ouch. You know what he said? Let that be a lesson to you, son. Don't trust anyone. Wow. Now, your dad didn't do that, did he? Your dad said, Petey, jump into my arms, I'll catch you. And then he kind of gave you some extra instruction. Don't stick your knees out, right? He, want, he didn't want to have black eyes, right, from your knees hitting him. But he wanted to make sure that he would catch you. And I guarantee that if you jumped really high or flailed about, your dad would still catch you, even if he would have fallen back and hurt himself. He would have caught you because he loves you and he wants to protect you. Now, sometimes in our world, we have parents like your dad who are loving and kind and will do whatever they need to do to protect and sometimes we have dads like that one guy I was telling you about who said to his son, jump, and he moved away and let him hit the floor, right? And because sometimes we have different understandings of our dads, when we hear about our Heavenly Father, 
Some people say, well, my dad was a great father, so our Heavenly Father must be a great father. And some people had really bad dads who abused them or did other bad things. And they say, oh, my dad was horrible, and he was mean, and he did terrible things to me. And, and, and if, if, if that's my, my earthly father, I don't want to have anything to do with my Heavenly Father. But the good news is, is that our Heavenly Father, as good as your dad is, he's even better. And he loves us, and he wants to protect us, and he says, trust me. And sometimes when we go through lives, we have to take kind of a jump, right? Like when I was in seminary, I kind of had to climb up a ladder and do scary things. And God's like, trust me. And I'm like, well, but I don't know what's going to happen. How am I going to get the money to live? God said, trust me. In fact, when I went to seminary, I had no idea where we were going to live. But then they told us, oh, don't worry about it. You can live in the new seminary housing that they were building. We drove up on campus. True story. My wife and I just married. And you know what the seminary housing was? It was a piece of flat concrete with tubes sticking up. That was it. We were supposed to start school in less than a week. And all I saw was a bunch of concrete. And I thought, where are we going to stay? And my wife Brenda asked me that. And I said, well, we've got a couple hundred dollars left to our name. I guess we'll have to stay in a hotel until our money runs out. And then after that, I don't know what happens. But God provided. And we lived in a basement of the girls' dorm. A very uncomfortable place to live for quite a few number of months. But we survived. We learned to eat out of a microwave. And it was kind of fun, right? God provides and he protects. But what we have to do is be willing to say, I trust you, Lord. I'll go what you want me to go and do, and I'll do what you want me to do. And what I want you to do, Petey, is remember that. Throughout your life, God may ask you to do things that are hard, sometimes very difficult or even scary. And just like you climbed that ladder and jumped into your dad's arms, God says, Petey, I got this. Trust me. And we can do the same. Okay? All right. Thanks a lot. You can sit down. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of every present heart be acceptable to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, if I were to, um, to summarize the state of Americans, especially throughout the last couple of years, I would say there's one word that really comes to my mind that just about everyone kind of got consumed by, and that's fear. And I get why COVID causes fear and panic, right? I mean, there are few things scarier than an invisible enemy that has the ability to kill you, right? I mean, you can't see it, and you can literally die from it. And indeed, some people, even perhaps some people that you have known personally, have died from COVID. And that gave us a very real sense of fear. And because of our fears, we were kind of led to sometimes maybe do the, the hard thing, in fact, maybe, maybe not even the right thing, in order to kind of get by. Churches literally closed down. We stopped meeting, right? Including my church in North Dakota at the time. Right? Some families literally separated. They said, you know, we don't feel comfortable living together in this house. We need to isolate ourselves from everyone and even within our own families, Right? People locked themselves down and decided that they were going to wait it out. And at first we were told by the experts that if we did our part, we would flatten the curve and then we as a nation would get through this. And it would just be a few days. But those few days turned into weeks, which turned into months, which turned into multiple years. And some people, if we're honest, are still wrestling with that fear, Right? Now, there's, there's a, a certain level of caution that I think we should all have, but, but it kills me when I see someone driving in their car with their windows rolled up and they're by themselves and they have a mask on. And I think, what are you doing? You are being gripped by fear, right? Fear can lead us down some really dark and dangerous paths. And, and while I have my own opinions about COVID and our response to COVID, my goal today is not to talk about COVID anymore. Rather, what I want to talk about is what lies behind COVID and our response to that, which is fear. And as I, as I started to really think about fear and how we can fight our fears that well up within us, 
I had kept coming back to just one scripture passage. I don't know if I've ever preached on just one verse from the Bible for a whole sermon. But I'm going to do that today, if that's okay. Now some of you are like, yes, a short sermon. Hold on, I'm a long-winded preacher. I can really pull that thing out. And that's what I'm going to do today. I just want to preach on just one verse. It's in John chapter 4, verse 1. These were Jesus' words. He said this, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. As I reflected on this passage, and I started to kind of chew on it. You know, did you ever have steak that was really low quality? <laughs> My mom's probably going to be watching this. So you got to be careful what I say. But she would serve a steak sometimes growing up. And you say, whoa, steak as a kid, that's pretty great. Uh, well, it was round steak. And if you know anything about steak, round steak is one of the worst cuts because it's super chewy. And as a kid, my mom would serve steak and I would cut into that thing and I would chew and I would chew and I would chew and the thing never seemed to break down. It was like a piece of rubber, right? It was tough. And to this day, oftentimes I really wrestle with Whenever I have a steak, sometimes I'm like, no, I'll just have a hamburger. <laughs> you, you chew up a hamburger, it comes apart in your mouth, right? It's the way a good steak should. But we need to do that sometimes with the scriptures. You know, we need to kind of chew on it. We need to really work it over. We need to think about it. We need to, to ask ourselves, am I doing what this verse is telling me to do? Am I believing what this verse is telling me to believe, Right? So I started to kind of do that with this one verse. And as I was reflecting on those words and I, and I started to think about it, I, I think it would be accurate to say that a lot of people have troubled hearts. And another way to say you have a troubled heart is that you have fear. Many people, regardless of how you view COVID, struggle and wrestle with fears. You can ask my wife, I get tense when I go up into high places, right? I don't like heights. And there's other things that cause me fear as well. And the, and the world seemingly is growing worse and worse off, right? And it's easy for us to allow our hearts to be troubled. It's easy to allow the fears to kind of creep in. And we start to really wonder, oh man, am I going to be able to make it? I'm scared. <coughs> but Jesus says these words, don't let your hearts be troubled. He basically is telling us that we don't need to fear. And notice he doesn't command us, hey, you better not be fearing or else. You know, some people, you know, they hear this and they think, but Jesus, I do fear. And man, now you're mad at me because I fear and I can't even come to you. Jesus says, ah, that's, look at the words. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. It's, it's kind of this attitude of there's no reason. Just let it go. Don't worry. Now, if you ask most Christians, are you trusting in God? They're going to say, yeah, yeah, I, I trust in God. I, I believe in God. And I believe most would say that. <clears throat> most would say and, and say, yes, I do trust in God. But do they really fully trust in God? Or do they still have fear? a certain level of distrust toward God about some things, that, that they believe in God as, as their God, and they accept Jesus Christ who came to this earth and died on the cross for their sins, and they say, well, yeah, Jesus is my Savior, I believe that. But do you really fully trust God enough to go where God calls you to go, to do what God calls you to do, no matter what? Theologically speaking... We rightly understand that God is all-powerful, right? When we say that. Not only that, but we know that God is all-knowing. You know, he's omnipotent. That's the fancy church word for all-powerful. Omniscient, the fancy church word for, for all-knowing. He's also present everywhere. Omnipresent, right? Another church word. And that on top of all that, that God is a good God who desires to bless mankind. And if all of this is true... Why are we fearing? Ask yourself that. Reflect back on your life. What is it, if you really think about it, is, is causing you fear? That you might lose your job and end out on the street? A long time ago, I remember watching a, a movie about a, a homeless musician. 
and, and, and he was very gifted. And he ended up being homeless. And then I started to think how easy it was for this guy to be homeless. And, and if something took a turn for the worse, what would cause me to do that same thing? And my wife had to kind of work me through this and say, Rich, you know what? We have a safety net. We have family. And on top of that, God loves us and he'll take care of us. You don't need to worry. You know, I have, I have a dear friend back in Tioga who is wrestling with, with some mental issues that are causing her to, to really struggle. And this is something that I know she's not, she doesn't want. And, and, and maybe that's something that, that is afflicting you right now, that, that, you, that you're worried about those, those voices in your head that you don't tell other people about. You're worried about that, that deep level of anxiety that you have every night when you go to bed. Maybe you're worried as you look at the bank account and you see it dwindling down and down and, and the cost of goods going up and up. Your car is only getting more miles on it and you think, I don't know what's going to happen to me. I mean, if, if we're really honest, I think probably all of us have some level of fear. Maybe it's a fear of being alone. Maybe it's something else. But should we have fear? Should we allow our hearts to be troubled? And Jesus says, no, don't let your hearts be troubled. You know, and if, if we start to think again as we're chewing on this concept, if we really dig into why do we have anxiety, why do we have fear, I believe at the root of that is sin. For at the core of most fear is very likely doubt. And the doubt is directed to God and his promises or his abilities or his desire to take care of us. For if God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and present everywhere, and a good God, there is no reason any of us should ever have fear or anxiety, and yet most of us still wrestle with that. But Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Hmm. Do you really believe? Jesus asked that. Do you really have faith? You know, faith is essentially what makes a Christian a Christian. It's not it's just an abstract theological principle or system that we have to understand. Faith is a belief in someone or something. And we all have faith in something. It can be a, a belief that, that if you're a child and you're jumping from a ladder, that your father is going to catch you, right? Right? It can be a belief that you go out into your vehicle, you insert the key and you turn it forward, that, that you have faith that the fuel pump will, will take fuel and pump it into your engine with just the right amount of pressure, and that there'll be a proper mixture of, of, of air and fuel, which will cause literally an explosion inside of your engine, and that explosion will be timed perfectly with a whole bunch of other explosions to get that car running to take you where you want to go. You probably never thought about getting in your car like that before, before, have you? And yet you have faith regularly that your car will do what it's supposed to do. We all have faith in many things throughout our lives. You know, when I went down to, to the store just a little bit ago to have my, my cholesterol medicine filled by the drug, the, the drug store there, I, I had to have faith that the crabby pharmacist, and she was very crabby, <laughs> would fill my prescription and not put arsenic in it because she didn't like me, right? I mean, it's crazy, but I had to have faith, and so far I'm alive, so I'm assuming she put the right stuff in there, right? I have faith every morning when I wake up that, that the laws of gravity will still work, and I'm not going to float off into space and die. You see what I'm going at? That we all have faith, don't we? We have faith in a lot of different things. But do you really have faith in God, the kind of faith that God calls us to? As Jesus said these words, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. So I ask you, do you believe? Do you believe in Jesus? And, and not just, yeah, 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 I believe. No, do, do you really believe? Believe in Jesus. Because if you do, has it affected how you live? 
Because if Jesus is really who you believe he is, the God of the universe, who took on flesh, we celebrated on Christmas. Oh, it's awesome. It's called the incarnation. That God himself stooped down and became like one of us. Put on flesh so he could live among us, teach us, and then die for us. If you really believe that Jesus did that, and that he invites you to follow him and become one of his disciples, shouldn't it affect how we live our lives? Countless people have prayed the prayer. <clears throat> they, they look at it as a golden ticket to wave around. I'm going to heaven. I pray the prayer. I'm in. But do they really believe in Jesus? Ask those same people who have, who have prayed and made a commitment to Christ if they trust Jesus, and they'll likely say yes. But a good question is, how far does that trust go? I'm going to show you a, a trailer for a video that came out in 2005. And I'll explain it afterwards. It's only about a minute long. That's okay, just pass forward to that. <clears throat> so this is the, the trailer for the end of the spear. Um, that's, what, that's what you get for trying to be fancy and insert a video clip, right? <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it working? Try unmuting it. And I so appreciate you doing this, Ty. There's no one likes to be that person in the back. <laughs> It's not playing right now, so it's paused. All right, it's not a big deal. So the end of the spear. Oh. Nice. All right. We have one chance to reach these people. All right, this is bad. All right, just we'll just don't worry about it. Just fast forward that. That's right. So uh, if you're interested in the movie, I, I have it. I can lend it to you. Um, but in 1956, there were five missionaries, families, entire families, uh, husbands, wives, and children that moved down into the jungles of Ecuador. And these five families dedicated their lives to reach the Wadoni Indian tribe. And no one had successfully reached this tribe of Indians before because of how violent they were. And uh, these five men decided after reaching out to them over a period of time that they were going to physically try to meet with them and share the gospel. And all five men were killed. They were speared to death by those men. And instead of the women who are now widows leaving the country with their families, instead of seeking retribution or just leaving, they went back into the jungles and offered the tribe of people forgiveness and mercy. And it was something that this tribe of people have never experienced. And as a result, almost the entire tribe of people were saved. And they came to the knowledge of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You know, if we're honest, it's easy to be a Christian when things are good. You know, when our 401ks are kind of fat, we're getting kind of close to that golden age of retirement. I don't know why they call it golden. <laughs> There's not a lot of a gold left in your accounts, and you sure don't feel very gold sometimes, right? But, uh, but when things are okay, it, it's not hard. But when things are not okay, when maybe you lose your husband, when maybe you lose your father, when maybe life is falling apart around you, can we still trust in God, can we still trust in Jesus when our spouse is sick with cancer, when we don't have any clue how things are going to work out, 
when we've just had a stroke and, and now we don't even really see right anymore. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. It's not easy. It's not easy. I'm here to tell you that. And I've taken some, some leaps of faith. <laughs> and I've had a, quite a few times where I've gripped that ladder and said, no, I'm not jumping, God. I don't trust you. Jesus says, trust me when you're uncomfortable. Trust me even when you're scared. Trust me even when you have doubts and fears creep in. Trusting in Jesus doesn't mean that you won't have doubts. Trusting in Jesus doesn't mean that you won't have fears. But trusting in Jesus means that when we have those doubts and fears, we say, Lord, I'm scared. I don't want to do this. But I'm trusting in you. And I'll go where you want me to go and do what you want me to do. There was a um, French man named Charles Blondin. He was born in 1824. He was considered by most to be the world's greatest tightrope walker. Karen Abbott, writing for the Smithsonian, figured that by the time he gave his final performance in 1896, it was estimated that Blondin had crossed Niagara Falls, care to take a guess, 300 times. Wow. That he walked more than 10,000 miles on a tightrope. Now, one of his trips was kind of unique, right? He carried his manager, Harry Callcord, on his back. And before Blondin made the trip, he uttered these words of warning to his manager. As Harry's on his back, pull the next slide up. Harry's on his back, and he's literally walking across Niagara Falls on a tightrope. And he says this, Look up, Harry. You are no longer Callcord." You are Blondin. Until I clear this place, be a part of me, mind, body, and soul. If I sway, sway with me. Do not attempt to do any balancing yourself, for if you do, we will both go to our death. Despite having a few guy ropes, those are the ropes that they connected on the sides to keep the, the main rope from swaying too much. Some of those guy ropes snapped. They made it both across safely. But what I found so powerful about that trip was, was Blondin's words to his manager. Blondin informed his friend and manager that as they went across together, they needed to become one. They needed to become connected. That they literally were thinking the same, acting the same, and being the same. They were no longer two people, but one. Likewise, Jesus is inviting us to not just be a follower of his, but to be united with him. You know, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper and in a few minutes, and we literally unite ourselves with Jesus. We take him into us, his flesh and his blood. We literally take into ourselves. Jesus invites us to do that. He invites us to follow him, yes, but to do as he does, to speak as he speaks, and to go where he goes. That's what it means to believe in Jesus. That's what it means to follow him. Don't attempt to do life on your own. Rather say, Jesus, what do you want me to do? And that's what I'll do. And we see this in our Bibles, don't we? You know, Peter, he was able to literally walk on water, supernatural feet that only God himself could do. Peter says, Jesus, if that's you, tell me to come on out and I'll walk on water. So Peter gets out and he starts walking on water and he's looking at Jesus. And then when does Peter start to sink? This is when he takes his eyes off of Jesus and looks at the storms and the waves. And then he starts to sink. And then the Bible says, immediately, Jesus grabbed Peter. Immediately, right? The apostles. <laughs> These were people, most of them were, were in the upper room and they were locked and they were afraid. You know, Peter denied Jesus three times. But the apostles, man, they were, they were bold and wise in the face of persecution and sung praises. The apostle Paul was beaten and shipwrecked and stoned and left for dead and thrown in a jail. 
And what I love about Paul is what is he doing when he's in jail? He's singing. I don't know about you, but if I got arrested for preaching the gospel and I was put in the jail, I'm pretty sure that I probably won't be singing there, right? Number one, I can't sing. <laughs> but number two, I probably wouldn't have that attitude. But why could they do that, though? Because they understood Jesus' words. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. If you want to better trust in Jesus, focus on Jesus. You know, there's another obstacle of overcoming our fear of trusting in God, and that obstacle is letting go of control, right? Romans 8, 28 says this, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purposes. I've had to teach my kids how to drive, and I'll be the first to admit my wife is much better. Do you know why? Because I'm not in control. <laughs> and it's hard for me when my kids are driving, and it's not exactly the way that I would drive, because I'm not in control, and, and I want to be in control. But that's true for most of us in our lives, don't we? God, this is what my life should look like. This is where I'm going to live. This is what I'm going to do. God, this is how my life is going to go. Correct? You see, God sees the big picture. He knows what's going to be happening around us. He understands that that one little ripple effect of us here in Astoria of doing one little thing is going to set in effect a chain of events that could literally affect people all the way across the globe. It's true. And even the bad things that happen to us, even those hard things that cause us to feel broken inside. And when we start to wonder, how can God really be loving? How can God really be true if all this bad stuff is happening to me? If that verse is true, that we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. All things mean good things and bad things. You see, this cosmic perspective that God has is so far above our pay grade. God sees the big picture. We don't. What we have to do is let go of control of our lives and say, I don't know where I'm going, God, but you do. The Bible says that God's word is a lamp unto our feet, not a searchlight in our future, a lamp unto our feet. That means that we know where to go that next step. Maybe we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know what we're going to be doing today. So when you get that promotion at work, praise the Lord. When you can afford to buy that dream house that you always wanted, God will use that. When your children get that scholarship to that school that they've been looking forward to, God will use that. When those things happen, we can claim Romans 8, 28 and say God is in control. But it also means this, that when we lose our job, we can't pay our bills, that our spouse gets cancer and dies, and instead of going off and getting married, our child gets addicted to drugs and ends up being homeless. God is still in control. And God can use even people's sinful, wicked things for his glory. Most of us are going to experience pain and loss and intense stress in our faith walk with God. Some might even endure trials like Job from the Bible. But it is even during these intensely difficult times that we need to keep our faith in God and our eyes on Jesus. For what did Jesus say? Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Believing and trusting in God is important when things are going well and the sun is shining. But believing and trusting in God is even more important when we feel like we are drowning and life is spinning out of control. Sometimes God uses our pain to teach us deep lessons of trust and peace and hope. What would have happened to that Wadoni tribe of Indians if those women became bitter and harbored unforgiveness? Or even said, you know, I forgive them, but I can't be around them. What would have happened? We must remember that despite our pain, despite our sorrow, despite our loss, that God is God. He's in control. 
even when we feel like life is spinning out of control, he can be trusted. You know, one of the greatest obstacles of really trusting in Jesus is simply letting go of the controls. Stop trying to be God. Stop trying to figure out all the details. So if you're in a season of joy and blessing in your life, praise God and allow this time to build your faith. And if you're in a season of pain in your life, look to Jesus and ask him to help you and praise him even now in your pain. You know, Monica Dickens wrote of a young boy named David in a book called Miracles of Courage. It was discovered at age two that David had leukemia. He was taken by his mother to Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston to see Dr. Don John Truman, who specializes in treating children with cancer and various blood diseases. Dr. Truman's prognosis was devastating. He told his mother he has a 50-50 chance of survival. And what seemed like countless clinic visits, blood tests, and rounds of intravenous drugs, David's mother's fear and pain for her child became overwhelming. Yet strangely enough, David never cried in the waiting room. And although his friends in the clinic had to hurt him and stick him with needles, he hustled into the clinic and always had a smile for his mother when they were through. And when he was three, David had to have a a very painful pr procedure known as a spinal tap. And it was, it was explained to him because he was sick, Dr. Truman had to do something to make him better. And if it hurts, his mom said, remember, it's because he loves you. His mother says that the procedure was horrendous. It took three nurses to hold David still while he yelled and sobbed and struggled. When it was almost over, this tiny boy soaked in sweat and tears looked up at his doctor and gasped, thank you, Dr. Tuman, for my hurting. Oh, if we could have a similar faith and trust as a little cancer boy named David, not in a fallible doctor, but in a loving God, who, when things are rotten, we can still say, God, I hate what is going on right now. But thank you. And the reason I thank you is not because I'm enjoying this pain, but because I know that you're in control and that you love me and that I have faith in you. So in closing, I remind you of the words of our Savior. Let your hearts, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Let's stop being fearful. Let's stop being fearful, especially of God, but wrap our arms around him and strive to be with him as he takes us through life. And like Blondin's manager held on to, to Blondin, let us hold on to Jesus. And then if we sway right or sway left, we hold on. Give up control of your life. Stop trying to control the events around you because honestly, you really can't. But with joy and thanksgiving, willingly say, come what may, thank you. Give up your fear. Give up trying to stay in control. Trust in God the Father. Trust in Jesus Christ. And allow the Holy Spirit to transform you from being fear prone to spirit prone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. Lord, we do have fears in our lives. Lord, our country is gripped by fear. And Lord, some people struggle with fear more than others, and it doesn't make those people worse off. We're all a bunch of people with hot messes. But Lord, we don't need to fear. We don't need to struggle. But what we need to do is place our faith and trust in you. Help us to have that childlike faith. Help us to be able to climb that ladder and to jump into your arms, trusting you. And whatever trials come, and whatever life throws at us, help us to trust. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know where my bulletin went to, but I think communion's next. Is that right? The hymn.
Hymn. All right, what's the hymn? Uh, 259. 259. Uh, let's stand as we sing together hymn number 259. You may be seated. As we prepare for Holy Communion, we think of Christ's words as he was celebrating the Last Supper with his friends, and he did something that was different. As he held up the bread and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you. For those of you at home taking communion, receive now a Christ's body broken for you. And the same way after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and drink. This is my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This is Christ's blood shed for you. For those of you at home, receive now the blood of Christ shed for you. And now for those of us here, uh, you'll be, bis be dismissed uh, by the ushers to come up and around here. And then if you prefer to remain seated, we will bring communion to you.
can now rejoice that even though our Savior Jesus Christ, who was crucified, died and buried, he rose again on the third day, and as a result, he stands victorious over death. And we who by faith trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord, who have received him, Jesus Christ, in our bodies, are united with him, and by faith we are forgiven. Amen. Let us pray together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The congregation will please rise as we sing our closing hymn, hymn number 287, O Jesus, I Have Promised. Receive now the benediction from the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 6. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in an unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen.